Hello! So I always really liked video essays and thought that they were fun and I liked listening to them so I was like, why not make my own? Why is there an empty water bottle on my amp? I'm sorry, okay, anyway. I was like, why not make my own video essay? And what other to make my first video essay on than one of my favorite albums of all time, Burn Pug- how do you say it? Wait, I can't believe I wrote an entire script for this and I never learned how to say the fucking name of the album. Pygmalion. Pygmy- Pig- Hold on. We have never been accused of being flash- Pygmalion. 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 So what better to make my video essay on than one of my favorite albums, Burn Pygmalion, A Better Guide to Romance by the Scary Jokes. Pygmalion is such a fucking stupid word. Why would- <laughs> Who made that word? Obviously this video is going to contain spoilers for the album. Probably the first time you've seen a spoiler warning on an album review. Or whatever this is. But yeah, the album is really interesting because it actually has a story and that's why it's one of my favorites. Also the music is just absolutely banger, which is another reason why it's one of my favorites. So if you do want to listen to the album yourself before you watch this video, you can do that if you want but you don't have to, you can do whatever you want. Part of the reason I'm making this video is to convince people to listen to it, so I don't know. Again, this is my first video essay I've ever made and I don't know shit about making videos and I'm recording this on my phone and sitting on my floor. The entire script was spontaneously typed on Google Docs on my iPhone without any prior planning or editing in the span of about two days, months ago. So if it's messy or rambly in any parts, then I apologize because I do tend to get on side tangents a lot even when I'm writing scripts somehow. But, um, yeah, let's, yeah, let's get to, into it, yeah. Burn Pygmalion, A Better Guide to Romance is a 2019 album by the New Jersey-based synth pop project, The Scary Jokes, following their previous albums, Bad at Math and April Fools. Wow, that took a lot of takes to record. Burn Pygmalion, A Better Guide to Romance is a two, why did I say it like a fucking news salesman? Burn Pygmalion, A Better Guide to Romance, a Jersey-based synth pop project, this- why do I not- why can I not say synth pop? <laughs> to give a bit of background on the scary jokes, it is a musical project created by the agender and sapphic artist and musician Liz Lehman. I hope I'm saying their last name right. If I'm not, I'm sorry. It could be like Lemon. <laughs> that would be a funny last name. You may have already heard some of their more popular songs before, such as like Community Gardens, Icicles, or Catabolic Seed. But surprise, there's more! Their Spotify description, which I assume is probably self-written, reads Hallucinogenic Light Prism Overlord of the Bedroom Scene slash synth pop band from northern New Jersey, along with a picture of Liz holding a sick-ass guitar, which I think sums them up pretty well as a person and a band, or whatever they are. Also, can we just talk about how cool Liz looks for a moment? Like, goddamn, look at that bullet. There's no way they're almost 30. I thought they were like... 21. Anyway, from what I know, Liz writes everything and does all of the vocals with the album art and most of the instruments along with the help of other band members such as guitarist Juniper Albernathy and previously bassist Ellie Bennett. I'm not even looking at the camera. <laughs> I have- <laughs> my, my iPad's in my bed right now. Like in- like in the thing. Oh my god. Are we good? What's cool about Burn Pamillion is that it tells a story. There are a lot of concept albums that claim to tell stories, although they usually are more like a vague story-like blob that's been left up for interpretation with the exception of a few repeating elements or themes that it lingers on, leaving fans to just grasp at straws as they overanalyze everything and debate theories until everyone eventually just decides on something and pretends it's official. But this album, on the other hand, has an official story and an official plot and characters who have names and careers and very complex personalities and pasts and I think it may be the first album I've ever seen do this. This is one of the reasons why it stuck out to me so much, among other albums. I mean, how much albums can you say have actual lore? This story follows two characters, Sylvia and Janine, who is also occasionally called Genie as a nickname. Thank you to my friend for helping me realize that Genie is a nickname and not just a misspelling of Janine, because I always thought it was just a misspelling of Janine on one of the song titles and was very confused. It regularly switches perspective from Sylvia to Janine to the occasional anonymous narrator, but for the most part it focuses on our protagonist, Janine, an entertainment journalist who has fallen deeply in love with movie star Sylvia. Gradually, we watch her spiral deeper and deeper into her unstable mental state as she reflects on her relationship with Sylvia while simultaneously trying to cope with her trauma and insecurities. This is a story of a romance, and it might be the most realistic and honest one I've ever seen. Sylvia and Janine's relationship is far from perfect or healthy and we get to see this directly from the inside. 
In real life, many relationships seem perfect on the outside to the point where some people may even be envious of them. But many people forget that relationships are different on the inside and much more complicated than what initially meets the eye. And you won't know what a couple or however many people are involved is going through unless you are part of it. This brutally honest portrayal of what it's like to be in a romantic relationship while simultaneously struggling with mental health issues and trauma from unhealthy past relationships is something that I think is done extraordinarily well. How past relationship trauma can affect a current relationship is something that I feel isn't talked about nearly as much as it should be, and this makes this album story just that much more impactful and serious to me. But we haven't even scratched the surface yet, baby. Throughout this video, I'll be covering each song from the album and analyzing it, explaining what is happening in it and what it means, along with any extra metaphors, references, themes, and other things that can be hidden inside these beautifully crafted lyrics. Seriously, they are really well written. Liz was probably pulling out this thesaurus like 20 times per song because there is no way that they just knew words like Leviathan off the top of their head. Also, a lot of credit goes to Genius Lyrics because I'm not nearly smart enough to analyze all the stuff on my own, so a lot of this is just other people's annotations they've left on lyrics of the songs that have been paraphrased and Frankenstein together along with my own thoughts. So yeah, this is not just me alone analyzing this. I'm stealing other people's thoughts. Okay, first song. Full disclosure. We start off with the song Community Gardens, a more popular song on the album that was also released as a single, featuring guitar by the musician and YouTuber Louis Zong. It doesn't have much to do with the actual story and is more of an introduction, but it still has some importance. According to Liz themselves, this song serves more as something that sets the tone for the rest of the album and eases us into it rather than one that has actual stuff happening in it that's significant to the story. This song is told by an anonymous outside narrator rather than any specific person and establishes a few themes that are touched on throughout the album such as isolation and how difficult it can be to form meaningful relationships with others in a world that seems oh my god this is such a long sentence it establishes a few themes that are touched on throughout the album such as isolation and how difficult it can be to form meaningful relationships with others in a world that seems only to be getting more and more harsh and uncaring as it goes on while this song isn't very important to the plot at all there is some possible foreshadowing here like the first line being full disclosure i am a monster could be seen as a parallel to the line you're just a monster with a bfa in the song pygmalion the last lines in the song are there are no more community gardens so i guess i'll have to settle for you the narrator feels like the world has turned its back on community and love, and so they'll just have to make do with their partner because that's all they'll have and probably all they'll ever get. The apocalyptic imagery of community gardens soon carries into the upbeat, optimistic song, Death Thrice Drawn, a song that quickly helps you realize how beautiful this album is going to be. The title references drawing the Death Tarot card, which represents significant changes in one's life. This new relationship is a significant turning point in both Sylvia and Janine's lives, and they only have more changes to come as their relationship progresses. This song marks the start of Sylvia and Janine's romance. Janine has been pining after Sylvia for a long time now, and has finally entered a relationship with her after their lives collided. Here we have the first Greek mythology reference, which Liz seems to really love making. There is no substance left for the worm to eat itself, references Ouroboros, a mythical symbol of a serpent eating its own tail, representing an infinite cycle. While Janine expects her and Sylvia's relationship to go on forever, she feels like they are going in circles and that it's going to slowly eat away at them. Janine and Sylvia are essentially in their honeymoon phase right now, and Janine is feeling very optimistic and excited about this new relationship. There's already some anxiety gnawing away at her, but she reassures herself that it's fine and that she's doing everything she's supposed to do, so it can't go wrong, can it? Spoiler alert, it can. We temporarily change perspective to Sylvia in the song Do You Believe Me, who is also dealing with her own anxieties. She worries that she's so deeply in love with Janine that it will lead to madness and it is implied that she turns to drinking as a coping mechanism. Though it's unclear if she already had a drinking problem before the events of the song or if it just started. Sylvia is also in her honeymoon phase at this point, wanting to show Janine off to everyone. She has a very positive public attitude about her new relationship and attempts to reassure Janine by telling her not to hide herself. This is an early sign that Janine has problems opening up and talking about herself and feelings, which we see a lot more of later. This song is somewhat short compared to the rest and mainly just serves to represent Sylvia's anxieties that have sprung up earlier in the relationship. Throughout this album, we mainly see Janine's anxieties and think Janine is the one who has more problems and sometimes it even seems a bit one-sided with how obsessive Janine can be later in the album, but we see that the feelings are actually more reciprocal than that. Sylvia also feels like she's obsessed with Janine and also is having anxiety about the relationship, so basically they both have problems. Following up on Do You Believe Me, Sylvia can tell that Janine is holding back on expressing her true thoughts and feelings and starts to become concerned over it. She knows that Janine is haunted by past events, but also knows that there's nothing she can do about it. Instead, she urges Janine to be honest about her feelings. 
It frustrates her that Janine isn't being upfront and never says what she means. She questions if Janine is scared of her or if this is all because of the person from her past that she's trying to leave behind. Eventually, she manages to get some honesty out of Janine, appreciating the rawness of it, but still wishing she would be more emotionally vulnerable. She states that in the end, it doesn't really matter if Janine is open or not, because Sylvia is already emotional enough to make up for what's missing. She almost feels embarrassed comparing herself to Janine because of how open and emotional she is next to her reserved and put-together partner. Part of the reason she wants Janine to be more open is to relieve her own self-consciousness about how she feels like an emotional mess next to Janine. So ultimately, this isn't a song about a struggle between the two of them, as they both want the best for each other, but more so about the internal struggles that they both deal with and how they are unintentionally affecting each other and making each other worse. Next we go to the song Pygmalion. This song is interesting because it has multiple different interpretations of whose perspective it is from. Before Liz themselves came out and clarified the song's meaning, it was widely believed that this song is from Janine's perspective, but it was kind of unclear how. People theorize that the person speaking in the song is representative of the people Janine has been with in the past that have made her paranoid about relationships by hurting her. Or they could be Janine's paranoid ideas of what Sylvia may be thinking, or maybe they could actually be Janine's inner thoughts, trying to play the role of the abuser so she has more control than she did before. And some people even believe that the song is from Sylvia's perspective and is about how she's manipulating Janine but is feeling guilty for the satisfaction it gives her. However, I feel that this theory doesn't hold much merit because Liz themselves has come out and said that Sylvia isn't the abuser in this relationship as many thought she was. The relationship is unhealthy, but it's much more complicated than a simple abuser and victim relationship. Something I like about this album is how realistic it can be when portraying unhealthy relationships. We usually think of toxic, unhealthy relationships as just an abuser and a victim, but sometimes it can be a lot more complicated than that. Sometimes they're both hurting each other. This is what we see in Sylvia and Janine's relationship pretty early. On. They both really love each other and really care about each other and they don't mean to hurt each other but it just keeps happening because they both got mad problems that they need to get therapy for but unfortunately they don't and it only makes things worse. Liz also confirmed that the song is neither from Sylvia nor Janine's perspective, stating that it's more of a cautionary tale than a plot point. Essentially, what I think they are saying is that this twisted relationship is what could happen to Sylvia and Janine if they don't solve their issues. This whole thing about Pygmalion is actually another Greek mythology reference. Pygmalion is a Greek myth about a sculptor who fell in love with a sculpture he had carved. This is used to represent someone who is deeply in love with their partner and yet is sculpting them, aka manipulating them. In this interpretation of that story, this relationship between Pygmalion and a sculpture is unhealthy and lopsided because a relationship where one person is carving the other to fit their perfect idea of a partner cannot possibly be healthy, especially when Pygmalion is the one who holds all the power over his partner. This song describes a very dark and twisted relationship, perhaps the kind that Janine fears or even the kind that she was in before that made her so scared about relationships. So it makes sense that it would serve as a cautionary tale for their relationship. It's more of a warning than anything. We hop back into Janine's perspective, where we will be staying for most of the album, although it does tend to flip-flop around more. In this song, Starstruck, Janine laments how she's deeply in love with Sylvia, but feels as if she doesn't really know the real her. She also feels inferior compared to Sylvia because of her celebrity status. Sylvia is a famous movie star who throws parties and wins awards, and next to her, Janine is just her journalist girlfriend. She doesn't feel like she lives up to all Sylvia is, and it makes her feel self-conscious. It's kind of interesting how their problems really reflect upon each other. For example, Sylvia feels self-conscious next to Janine because Janine is much more put together emotionally than she is, and with how emotional and kind of dysfunctional she is, it makes her feel self-conscious. And that's one of the reasons why she wants Janine to be more upfront about her emotions and more expressive, so she can feel less bad about herself. But on the other hand, Janine feels self-conscious next to Sylvia because she feels like she's nothing compared to her. Sylvia is a whole famous movie star who throws parties and has thousands of fans brought probably, and that makes her feel like she's just some person next to her. I mean, she's just a journalist. How is she supposed to compare with this literal superstar she's dating? Throughout the album, Sylvia is referred both metaphorically and literally as a star due to her celebrity status, and so Janine is starstruck by her. In Pygmalion, we have the line, you think that you're such a star, ha, huh, what a fraud you are. Even in Community Gardens, we have the lyric, the price that you pay for arrogance and a false of immunity is to face the wrath of a dying star, although it's unclear if this is directly related to Sylvia or not. I think it's interesting how this song kind of parallels the song Janine. Sylvia feels like she doesn't really know the real Janine because she's so closed off about her emotions and herself. 
but feels self-conscious next to her because of how put together she is. But on the other side, Janine feels like she doesn't know the real Sylvia because of how different she acts sometimes, and feels self-conscious next to her because of her celebrity status instead. Both of the girls have very similar insecurities and worry about themselves and each other, and they clearly aren't communicating them well enough. I'm gonna briefly analyze some of the lyrics and say what they mean. Sylvia, you are a fugitive on the run, not sure from what every day. Despite Sylvia's emotional openness, she frequently acts different and even sort of mysterious, causing Janine to feel like she doesn't really know the real Sylvia. Which isn't good in a relationship, if you didn't know. Sylvia, do I measure up to the monolith of celebrity? Though I do feel rather Leviathan as a faithful shadow. So Janine says she feels inadequate next to Sylvia, just having a place in Sylvia's life does make her feel special. Leviathan is a biblical creature, a huge, very powerful sea monster, but it can also be a word used to describe something that is very big and powerful, and this is probably how just having a piece of Sylvia's stardom and just being a part of her life makes Janine feel. Leviathan. Throughout the song, we frequently see Janine's anxiety show through the lyrics, saying things such as, Sylvia, please tell me the rumors aren't true, Sylvia, it'd be such an honor to meet the real you. While in contrast to this, the choruses are her positive positively talking about how much she loves Sylvia and how happy she makes her feel. Next we go to Your Vicious Kin. Janine feels like she's becoming a worse person as a result of being in a past toxic relationship and she feels like she just can't control it. That's just something that's inevitably happening and she's just watching it and can't stop it. And the first verse she references the play No Exit by, Jean by Jean-Paul Chate. What is up guys? Bonjour, this is Julian the Frenchman who makes French pronunciation videos. <laughs> Is that he fell? He fell into a Jean Paul Paul Sartre. And I found this a video that says how to pronounce Jean Paul Sartre real life examples. And for some reason, it just has a clip of someone talking about the plot of Toy Story Four in the very middle. They don't say Jean Paul Sartre. They don't say anything in French. They don't. It has no connection to it. There's just a fucking Toy Story clip in there for no reason. Anyway, in the first verse, Janine references the play No Exit by Jean-Paul Sartre. She says she started off as an Estelle, an emotionally disconnected woman who drives her lover to suicide, but now sees herself as more of a Nines, a cruel and manipulative woman. She feels like this past toxicity is fully corrupting her and she's becoming like them. Your vicious kin are infecting me, now I'm becoming one of them. This song is kind of short, so there's not much else to say about it, but it certainly is a turning point for Janine and not a particularly good one. Here we're at Admire the Architecture, which is a pretty interesting song, but there's not really much to analyze because it kind of just says what's going on. Here we get a break from both Sylvia and Janine's inner thoughts as the speaker is just a narrator who describes what's happening. Up until this point, Sylvia and Janine have been together physically. I don't know if they're living together or what, but you know, they've been together. When so suddenly Sylvia has to go away for a while to film a movie and ask Janine to stay at her house and take care of it while she's away. While Janine is alone, she begins to spiral out of control with Sylvia's absence only feeding into her loneliness. She's someone who is used to being around people and now she's suddenly left all alone at Sylvia's countryside home, finding the quietness unnerving because it's so unfamiliar to her. The two still talk over the phone frequently, but Janine worries that the relationship isn't going to be as sustainable with the new distance between them. Janine's fears of abandonment and past toxic relationship patterns repeating turns into misplaced resentment towards Sylvia and her absence. Janine has started becoming confused and doubtful of her feelings for Sylvia and whether they're really romantic or not, referring to Sylvia as my love and saying, after all, I'm just a friend in the same sentence. This whole song is very contradictory and conflicting. Janine talks about how she wants to stay close to Sylvia and adores her while simultaneously seeming to be sarcastically criticizing her. Her paranoid thoughts have begun to manifest as negative feelings against Sylvia, conflicting with the intense infatuation she still feels for her. Next we have Janine, Your Tragedy, and I'm really excited to talk about this because it's my favorite song in the album and also just one of my favorite songs in general. Not just because of the lyrics, but because it's just so good. The instrumentals are so good, I'm literally obsessed with the riff that plays throughout the song. And also just how blatantly undeniably gay it is, with Janine referring to Sylvia as girl throughout the whole song. Like, yep, this is undeniably a love song between two women. And if you're wondering why I love that so much, 
Anyway, this song does have a lot of actual meaning to it other than just being insanely groovy and insanely gay. Sylvia leaving has caused Janine's logic to sort of deteriorate and she feels like Sylvia has abandoned her and chosen her fame over her. She feels used and forgotten and her past trauma isn't helping with these thoughts, yet at the same time she's still so deeply in love with Sylvia that she feels like she can't leave her. Janine feels like Sylvia has left her hanging. She crops Janine out of the pictures she posts on social media and doesn't invite her to parties that she throws for charity. This is most likely just Sylvia trying to protect her girlfriend from the dangers of the limelight, but Janine doesn't realize this and feels instead that Sylvia is purposefully ignoring her and excluding her. When Janine is talking about how Sylvia doesn't invite her to parties, she claims that Sylvia said she'd distract from all the tragedies if she invited her to her charity parties most likely giving a lighthearted explanation for why she doesn't invite Janine. Her being there would distract Sylvia from the seriousness of the event. But Sylvia, riddled with insecurities and a spiraling, neurotic mindset, only views this as a sign that Sylvia isn't committed to the relationship and doesn't care about her. Despite Sylvia making her feel like this, she's still deeply in love with her and would immediately come coming back to Sylvia if she called her. Basically, these extremely conflicting and confusing feelings that she has for Sylvia of why are you like this to me, I kind of hate you, and oh my god, I love you so much, I never want to leave you, are getting worse and... Oh my god. Sorry, I just stopped talking because my friend just got a new haircut. She got a mullet and it looks really good. Congratulations on the new haircut, Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we're moving on to Emotional Vagrant. This song is mostly representative of Janine looking back on a former lover who hurt her and gave her the trauma and insecurities that she is dealing with today. Janine is coping with suicidal thoughts, aka the urge to desert her woes. And the reason she hasn't yet attempted suicide is because she doesn't know what would come next in the afterlife and is scared of it. She reflects on the cycle of manipulation her past abuser would put people through, squeezing all the joy they could get out of their partner and then quickly getting bored and moving on to someone else. Janine calls out this pattern, implying that it's just an excuse for not being emotionally vulnerable with other people. Though Janine herself struggles with being emotionally vulnerable and open, she's already learned in her relationship with Sylvia that it's the only way to achieve true emotional closeness and fulfillment with another person. Janine's past abuser would manipulate people and then move on to the next victim after they got bored. But the metaphorical ghosts of their previous victims still haunt them, as this past relationship also haunts Janine. A vagrant is someone who wanders from home to home without a set place to live. This person is an emotional vagrant who quickly moves from person to person and never stops to settle down. Damn, no wonder Janine is so fucked up from this person. I would be too! The instrumentals at the end of Emotional Vagrant smoothly transition into Sleepyhead, a song that serves as a temporary period of peace for Sylvia and Janine's relationship. As they get closer to closer to ending the relationship, the conflict pauses temporarily as Sylvia reminds Janine of how much she cares about her no matter what. There's dust upon the stairs, mansion has the air of a tomb, she hardly leaves her room. Someday. Seems to be referring to Janine staying in Sylvia's mansion, which has grown dusty and gloomy as a depressed Janine neglects it. The song follows a theme of religion, mentioning church, God, and prayers numerous times. Sylvia seems to be more accustomed to the bleakness of life than Janine, and so Sylvia prays each night that life doesn't wear her down. She states that she isn't the religious type and has never prayed for anyone else, but she still cares so much about Janine that she prays that things will get better for her, hoping that the message will somehow get through to her. Sylvia also seems to reciprocate the uncertain feelings that Janine has gotten of whether they are friends or lovers, saying, please don't forget that I'm your friend. She specifically refers to herself as Janine's friend then rather than anything else, which could come from confusion on what their feelings really are for each other, but it also could mean that the girls are friends with each other before they are lovers, and even if their romance ends up not working in the end, they will always deeply care for each other as friends, which is a nicer way of looking at it. Oh, no. We immediately get thrown into some emotional and instrumental whiplash as we cut to the fast-paced song Wrath of the Termite King. So this song is actually still in Sylvia's perspective, who has just learned of all the thoughts Janine has been hiding from her this whole time. She's seen that Janine's insecurities have overtaken her entirely, taking the form of a metaphorical parasite that is infecting and controlling Janine. Sylvia feels that she hasn't seen the side of her girlfriend for a long time and wonders how long she's been hiding it from her. 
It comes to tear down the relationship when it's finally gotten to a high point, rearing its head at them. Sylvia feels incredibly guilty for not being more attentive and not realizing Janine's insecurities about the relationship before. She compares Janine's emotional baggage to termites with how they eat away at their relationship and prevent it from stabilizing. This is eating away at Sylvia too, and she's been frequently messing up on the set of her movie because of how much she's been thinking of it. She feels like she's letting down Janine saying, But whether this line is referring to how she feels like Janine is her biggest fan or if she's reducing Janine down to just the status of a fan is unclear. These insecurities are out to destroy Janine completely, and Sylvia becomes extremely frustrated at the metaphorical termite king that's hurting her. She misses Janine and just wants her back, wishing that the termite king dies and leaves them alone forever, saying that it's immaterial and can't touch them. This song serves to show that Sylvia really does care deeply about Janine and her worries, even if we don't always see her express it, especially when we're seeing from the cloudy, warped perspective of Janine. When people interpret this album, I feel like a lot of people kind of just see Sylvia as this ruthless abuser who doesn't care at all about Janine. But this entire song's purpose is saying that she does. She just didn't know about all her insecurities before because Janine was hiding it so well. She didn't want Sylvia to know. But now she does, and Sylvia feels extremely guilty for it. Right after, we cut back to Janine's inner thoughts. And this song might just be the peak of her spiral. Her fears have completely taken her over, and she feels that she'll never be able to be in a normal relationship because she just can't love a healthy amount. Her past relationships have affected and reconstructed the way that she loves so much that she feels like her heart is irreparably damaged, and that she's only able to be obsessive rather than love normally. Worrying that her neurotic behavior has damaged her relationship with Sylvia, she internally begs Sylvia not to leave her and to reassure her that her relationship will end, which is her biggest fear at the moment. She feels like she can't possibly be happy in a relationship if she doesn't have control because of what her past trauma has done to her. She has no leverage, aka control, and therefore she has no pleasure. Janine has internalized the toxic mindsets of her abuser and of Pygmalion mentioned earlier, taking on their possessiveness and the need for control. Janine feels like she can only be worth something in a relationship if she is giving something else to the other person, desperately claiming that she can be a person if Sylvia gives her the chance. She's aware that she's spiraled so bad that she's hit a new rock bottom that she hasn't hit before and that's damaging everyone else around her, especially Sylvia, but she just can't control herself. The chorus throughout the song is just her repeating the phrase I love you over and over, feeling overwhelmed with her obsession with Sylvia. According to her, Sylvia has hijacked her mind and she just wants her to fill everything that she's lacking. Eventually, this repeating I love you, I love you, I love you is joined by lower vocals underneath repeating I need you, I need you, I need you. She doesn't just love Sylvia, she feels that she needs her to survive and can't possibly function without her because of how codependent her trauma and insecurities have made her. Nearing the end of this album and the story, we enter the beautiful ballad Crushed Out on Soda Beach, which is actually the song that originally convinced me to listen to this album. It's also probably my favorite love song, like, ever. It's just so goddamn pretty. It starts out with Janine saying, I always thought was about her saying she almost broke up with Janine and then ended up not doing it because it making such a big and sudden decision is something she isn't used to. Makes sense, right? But no, according to Liz on Twitter, she literally tries to burn the whole thing down. This girl, for whatever reason, tries to burn Sylvia's house down. And I know Sylvia isn't there and all, and it's just Janine in there alone, so it's not like she's hurting anyone, but still, that's your girlfriend's house. Anyway, she apparently ends up not going through with it because the song doesn't mention it again for some reason. Reason. Instead, it moves on to Janine talking about her nightmares and how they seem to taunt her about her insecurities. Even in her dreams, she's too weak to stand on her own and has become so codependent on Sylvia that she can't work through her feelings for her without help from Sylvia herself, and this causes her to collapse under the weight of Sylvia in her dream and emotionally collapse under her in real life as well. Though she initially was going to break up with Sylvia, she decides against it because she loves and needs her. Instead, she makes the decision to regain control over her own emotions so she can begin to love Sylvia in a healthy Anyway. Even with all her insecurities and problems, she wants to get better and keep trying rather than give up on her relationship. She's going to work hard on improving because she loves Sylvia and Sylvia loves her back. She tells Sylvia to stay with her because she loves her too much to let her go and needs her here, and Sylvia obliges. After this long journey, we have finally arrived at the end of the album, closing with the song Bets Against the Void. 
Here we see Janine taking things a day at a time after things have gotten calmer for her. Now that she's finally reunited with her girlfriend and is no longer suffering from isolation and loneliness, she is calmly living in the present. She still has anxieties and feels like Sylvia's feelings for her will inevitably fade and she'll be left alone again. But for now, she feels good and decides that at the moment, that's what matters. Sylvia has noticed Janine's desperation for love and is fulfilling it, helping to diminish Janine's insecurities. Every day, Janine flips a metaphorical coin, betting against the void that today will be better. And when she does end up making good memories, she keeps them and carries them around with her. Though she is still convinced that her and Sylvia's relationship will eventually end and it's just inevitable, she hopes that Sylvia will remember her after and that their love will never be forgotten. And besides, for now they're together and things have gotten better and that's what's important to her. So, what have we learned from this album? Number one, Liz Lehman is a god. Number two, communication relationship is so important. Note how one of the biggest reasons why Sylvia and Janine had so many issues in the relationship is because Janine didn't tell Sylvia about her insecurities in the relationship. Insecurities and worries about a relationship are not something that you should hide from the other person. If you want your relationship to be effective, you have to actually talk to the other person. I know it can be really hard and scary to do, especially if you're like me and don't like being serious, or if you're like Janine and don't feel comfortable being emotionally vulnerable around other people. But if you're in a relationship with someone and you really want it to work, being able to trust and effectively communicate with your partner is just about the most important component to making it work. Otherwise, you're just going to be tiptoeing in circles around all your issues, and that's not going to get you anywhere until you break up over something that you could have avoided way earlier by just being honest and talking about it. And plus, if you don't trust your partner enough to feel like you can talk about your problems with them, then maybe they're not right for you in the first place, because there needs to be a layer of trust and security there. It's like the social hierarchy of needs. The bottom is a sturdy foundation of trust and security, then communication, then love and flirting and your love languages or whatever, and then, I don't know, holding hands or getting pegged or something. People have different things that are important to them, I don't know. And number three, being in a relationship when you have negative experiences with relationships before is something really difficult to deal with, as well as being in a relationship when you're simultaneously dealing with different mental health issues and insecurities. Trust me, I would know! But the point is that it can and will get better, as cliche as it sounds. It will be difficult and there's a lot of issues that you will struggle with. You'll be terrified that it'll happen again and you'll be terrified that you're going to become like your abuser and it's just kind of terrifying in general, really. But if you have a partner who is patient and understanding with you, it makes things so much easier. Being emotionally vulnerable is terrifying when you know it's only caused you to be hurt in the past and it's easy to just want to close off all your emotions and be distant from everyone. But the whole point of relationship is to be emotionally vulnerable with each other. That's what trust is, really. Knowing that you're safe enough to put yourself in a vulnerable position without getting hurt. And when you open up and put yourself in that position of vulnerability and you don't get hurt and are instead met with love and your partner being emotionally vulnerable and open to you as well, you start training your subconscious to think, huh, maybe this isn't so bad after all. Maybe not everyone is out to hurt me. But you really need to focus on working through these issues and not letting them hurt other people because this album just shows what can happen if you don't get help for your problems and keep it all bottled up inside. While you're desperately trying to avoid getting hurt, you'll only end up hurting others in the process, whether you're realizing it or not. And that's why it's important to get help for your problems. You aren't just going to heal over time if you don't do anything to help that process of healing. Honestly, it's probably going to take a long time to get better and it's going to be a long and complicated process. But if your partner is right for you, then they'll be able to help you every step of the way, so talk to them. Like I said, communication is most important, right? So if they want to help you, let them. Being treated with genuine love and care can feel so refreshing when you're used to not even being treated like a person. And it's going to help you so much because eventually you'll realize that you deserve to be treated like a person. And number four, Liz Lehman is a god. I'm really sorry for how cheesy that got towards the end. Like I said, I wrote all of this in like two days and I honestly do not remember writing any of that last part. I think I was like possessed by a psychologist or something. This album is really good and if you haven't listened to it yet, then you should. Obviously it's not gonna be for everyone and some of the songs are kind of mid, but some of them are literally my favorite songs and I really love them. So yeah, keep calm, Stan Liz Lehman and um good luck out there bye also i'm really sorry that the entire time i wasn't making eye contact and was instead just staring down at my script i'm really not good with memorizing things so yeah <laughs> sorry